Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentary films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Ja, yeah, well, a warm welcome at the Bali. My name is Juri Albrecht. I'm the director here, and I will be. Um, asking questions after the lecture of Professor Frank Furedi, and it's a great honor to uh, announce him um, here tonight. We're very happy that you're here. Um, we, this is part of a lecture series on um, what we call the populist turn. We've been conducting this with, uh, together with the Time to Talk Network. It's one of the programs we do in sort of our bigger program, Act for Democracy. Um, we, um, we have been looking and been asking questions about um, um, the populist turn to under better understand what's happening in Europe and um, to what's happening to voters, what's happening to politics in Europe. And um, uh, Professor uh, Frank Furedi is, well, is a sociologist um, uh, from England. He's from the uh, University of Kent. And he um, writes um, pro prolific on um, uh, matters as um, fear. And he recently, um, uh, he's one of the most um, cited sociologist of the UK, and he recently published, among many, many other books, I mean, he's, if you see the, if you see his uh, list of publications, it's unbelievable, but among many other things, he'd just written uh, Populism and European Culture Wars, the Conflict of Values Between Hungary and the EU. Um, very, very um, interesting book. And um, uh, Frank Furedi found himself, um, I think, maybe a little bit too surprised, but I'm going to ask him after, <laughs> afterwards. Um, uh, in defense of um, the Hungarian way of conducting their democracy, um, that's interesting because um, he used to be way back, but he used to be a, a founder of a communist party in the United Kingdom. He used to be a member of the International Socialist. So it's it's interesting how he how he came to um, these positions and how, what he what he thinks about um, democracy in Europe and democracy in Hungary. So we especially asked him also because of that. Uh, also because of his insights into uh, uh, politics and, and, and democracy. Um, also because I'd like to talk about um, how he changed or might have changed his views over the, over the years and decades. It's interesting because that's what's happening to a lot of po voters and population in Europe. So um, um, he's giving first a lecture, then we have a conversation, and then you um, have uh, the possibility to join in as well, so I hope you will. Professor, the floor is yours. <laughs> Right, uh, good evening, and thank you very much, Yuri, for inviting me. I think that politics in Europe and in the Western world is very interesting. And it's interesting because people are changing their minds all the time. People who voted one way vote another way. Uh, you find a degree of fluidity, which is uh, quite unprecedented in European political life. And for the first time, I think what I find fascinating and potentially quite inspiring, is that a lot of people no longer vote in the way that they're expected to vote. I was very delighted by the Italian elections, not because I particularly like the parties, but I was very delighted that the old Italian oligarchy got kicked up in the rear end and realized that that day had gone. And when I was in Italy, I was in Lombardy recently, I was talking to all these young kids in, uh, in Menaggio and in uh, Como, and they were all buzzing and they were very excited. They were saying, we're gonna make a new world. Uh, we're doing something very, very different. And it really reminded me of the morning after Brexit in England, 
when a lot of people in England were saying, wow, for the first time, the way we voted actually mattered. You know, for the first time in our life, we voted in a way that made a difference, whereas in the past, you know, no matter how you voted, the same old people got elected, the same old decisions were made, and it didn't really matter what had occurred. And I think that kind of sense of possibilities for me, as somebody who is what I call a 1960s person who lived through the wonderful events of the 1960s, is like a second coming and something that I, I find uh, a little bit inspiring. And what I want to really talk about is precisely what is going on. How, do I, how would I interpret what we see as the, uh, how do I see what is seen as being the populist moment? I think the populist moment should be understood very carefully because not everything that is called populist is populist. I think these days, particularly the mainstream media calls populist anybody they don't like, anybody that votes differently than they do. Populism becomes this catch-all phrase for people that are not like us. It's a way of differentiating, you know, sort of us respectable, you know, sort of people who uh, are aware, unlike the xenophobic nationalistic scum that are populist. I think that, that tends to be this attempt to create this polarized view of the thing. Whereas in fact, when I travel around Europe, people that are called populists are very different. Somebody who votes for Podemos in, in Spain, or somebody that votes for the Five Star Movement, or somebody that votes for the Front National in France, or Hung Hungar Hungarian uh, Fidesz government, are very, very different. So the first point that I would emphasize is that we need to understand the context. There are some things that are very general, that are part of a wide all European pattern, but there are also very important particular differences that we need to acknowledge and understand. I think that's really quite crucial. According to my analysis, what we're seeing is not so much populism marching forward from strength to strength, not so much a kind of a wave of new politics emerging that is, uh, in a sense, fueled by a, an incredibly systematic, coherent dynamic. I think uh, what we're seeing instead is the opposite. I think what we're seeing is, uh, is something happening on the other side. And it, it seems to me that the key to un understanding what's going on is to understand that European political life is growing through a, a fundamental legitimacy crisis that the old order, the old political parties, uh, whether they're on the left or on the right, and even that doesn't make very much sense. I don't know who's left and right anymore when I look at Holland or England. You know, sort of, uh, they all seem to be what we would call zombie parties who, you know, call themselves socialists but wouldn't know what a socialist looked like even if they bumped into it. And similarly, a lot of conservatives who call themselves conservatives are too scared to uphold their tradition, their values, their religion, their they're really much alienated from that. So we have a lot of zombie parties, but what we're really seeing is that the old parties have really given up on communicating the uh, ideals and the views that define them throughout the whole post-war period. It's a fundamental crisis of authority. And you see that particularly on the left, what's called the left, where left-wing political parties are conspicuously unable to articulate anything that even vaguely resembles anything to do with traditional lefting politics. I was in Italy recently, and in Italy we got a party, the Pede, the, the Democratic Party, and what's interesting about the Democratic Party, this is the left in Italy, is if you look at the membership and who votes for it, well, it's not the Sicilian working class, it's not Roman workers or the, or the, or the people in Turin who are working at the assembly. The Pede is a party of the political elite. You know, they're university educated, professional people, if you look at the statistical breakdowns of who voted for who, the left-wing payday party has got the voting, voters who got the highest income, right? They are uh, what we used to call in the old days the ruling class, right? And that's the left, you know, sort of, whereas all the other parties, uh, the working class people, have moved somewhere else. Similarly, in my, in, where I live in England, if you look at the Labour Party, the Labour Party has become a party of the London, it's a London party. And it's a London party of professionals. It's a London party of, of public sector servants. It's a, it's a party of the cultural elites. And it's a party that finds it almost impossible 
to conduct a conversation with working class people. Where I, I grew up in Hungary, I go back to Hungary quite a bit. We, we have a party called, you know, we have people who call themselves left wing, but these left wing people no longer even bother to go into a working class district to talk to working class people about you know, voting for them. They're entirely confined to the central areas of Budapest, to the posh cosmopolitan areas of Budapest, where they feel very comfortable to talk to people like, just like themselves. But given how, but if they're gonna go to a, a, an area, and Hungary's got two million very, very poor people, you know, who are struggling, who need representation. And the one thing that you will not find in those areas where these people live are, are parties or people that call themselves left wing. So we have a fundamental crisis of authority, of, of legitimacy throughout Europe. And I think that under those circumstances, where the traditional parties of, of the post war era are no longer able to uh, give an account of themselves, you know, politics unravels. And I think it's the unraveling of politics that has given an opportunity to the Five Star Movement in Italy, to the you know, different parties in Holland or UKIP beforehand in, in England to move forward. It's not that these parties are necessarily strong intellectually or ideologically or coherent, because you can see that in the case of England, for example, one day UKIP is wonderful, it's going from strength to strength, you blink your eyes and UKIP doesn't exist. It's not there anymore. But the dynamic and the, and, the, and the forces in society that created UKIP in the first place are still there. People are still looking for answers, and people are looking for answers that are very, very different than what they get from the technocratic, elitist, you know, political, cultural individuals within the European Union. So I think that's the fundamental uh, dynamic that is going on. That's the one thing that binds together Poland, Hungary, Spain, Italy, Greece, and a number of other societies. It's the crisis and ultimately the bankruptcy of the, of the mainstream political parties, which afflicts Holland as much as any other society. I mean, all you gotta do is look what happened to the socialists in Holland. Now you see them, now you don't, you know, sort of, and uh, similar things happening throughout, throughout, throughout the whole Western world. So we need to be bear that in mind because unless we understand that, we explain everything by the populists. Somehow, mysteriously, people are voting this particular way. People are voting for the new parties because they basically become entirely switched off from political movements and mainstream political parties that have got no legitimacy in their eyes. It's a fundamental, it's a legitimacy crisis that we see periodically in human history, when all of a sudden the papacy in the Middle Ages uh, is no longer seen as, 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 as our spiritual mentors and people move away from the papacy. We have many, many examples when that occurs and that's the wonderful and interesting thing about our times that we're now going through a moment of transition. We don't know what's gonna happen because at the moment the new populist parties that are called populist are still very confused, they're inquired, they're searching for ideas. They haven't been able to develop a systematic uh, political outlook for themselves. So it's all confusing, it's all very, very fluid. So that's the first thing I think that's really quite important uh, to kind of uh, bear that in mind. I think the, the populist moment is also a healthy reaction against the European Union and to the European Union's oligarchy. Now I know I'm in a minority of one when I say this, but if you look at the European Union, uh, you know, sort of the European Union uh, thinks that it represents Europe. Well, as a European, I don't recognize that. I think the European Union uh, represents a particular set of interests and a particular group within U Europe itself. And I think it's really unfortunate that we often confuse the European Union with Europe and, and European values and European ideals. But it seems to me that there is a, a very strong reaction against the EU project, the European Union project. I think that people have begun to feel that the European Union represents a form of social engineering, a kind of technocratic intervention in their life that alienates them from their everyday experience. Uh, and I think uh, this is something that's been recognized for a very, very long time. You don't have to be an opponent of the European Union like myself to recognize that the EU has a legitimacy deficit. I think for many, many decades, 
the leaders of the European Union have talked about the fact that you know, we are not seen as being legitimate in the eyes of the people of Europe. In other words, what they really are saying is that when a French person or a Dutch person or an English person gets up in the morning and they brush their teeth, they don't say, oh my God, I love the European Union. Right? That's not how people think about the European Union. It's, it's something that is detached from their experience. It's something that is alienated. And of course, there are some young people who've been educated into believing that the European Union is God's gift to human civilization, and they kind of hope that there is something in there, but they pretty soon, as they get older, sw get switched off from that when they realize that developments in Brussels are not as positive as they believed. And it seems to me uh, that the kind of values that the European Union has been put forward and the national partners in the different countries have promoted uh, have really provoked a reaction. So what are these things that have provoked a reaction on the part of people? And I think that that's something that you see in a number of other places. I think the first thing about the European Union, uh, and something that I find the most disturbing, is its tendency to depoliticize public life. I think the European Union uh, uh, is based upon uh, what we call insulated governance, where you insulate the political classes from public pressure, where you create you know, sort of a variety of non-elected institutions who basically make decisions about a, about a growing range of experiences. In Europe, under the EU, we have more NGOs than rats. At the moment, they're just everywhere. And, and they assume that they got the moral authority to make pronouncements on everything to do with our lives. Uh, you have a situation where the human uh, rights uh, court and, the, and, and European courts of justice are not just simply uh, making pronouncements on narrow juridical and legal matters, but take it upon themselves to say, oh, that is your human right. And basically decisions that would have been called political in a different era all of a sudden become juridified, all of a su sudden acquire a legal form. And I think as a result of that, when, for example, economic policy is taken out of the hands of people, I mean, who decides about people's rate of interest, who decides about people's financial policies. It's not the government, it's not you or me, it's some technocratic institution. When everything gets, that is truly important, becomes depoliticized, uh, then obviously that is something that people feel quite strongly because whenever they want to change their world, when a Greek or an Italian or an English person says, we need to change the world in this particular way, then we're told, oh no, no, we can't do that. We can't really do that because the European bank and, and the decision about the euro and various economic policies that have been decided by God have a, have a preeminence over people making those kinds of decisions. I think people know that. People intuitively understand that when so many of the key decisions have been taken out of their hands, there is something fundamentally flawed uh, in their lives. And, that, and most people, maybe not in this room, but most normal human beings, do not trust experts and, and, and do not trust technocrats to the point at which they're p p willing to give up uh, those kinds of decision making. So the outsourcing of authority to technocratic institutions is something that people really dislike and, and, and react against. The second thing that I think is, is really important, particularly in East Europe, is the EU's consistent attempt to denationalize public life. I mean, one of the things that I find quite disturbing is the way that anything that smacks of national sensibilities, a sense of belonging to a nation, of patriotism, is immediately labeled as this extreme form of nationalism. You, you cannot feel good about being English or good about feeling Dutch without it being the first step to being a xenophobe, without being racist. That is like a com you know, complete you know, sort of uh, impossibility. The idea that somehow you feel special being French, and you feel really good about that, is seen as a cultural crime. And it's promoted as, as seen as a cultural crime. And the consistent attempt to denationalize public life, to separate people's everyday existence from their national circumstances, is something that a lot of people don't feel very good about. Because as far as they're concerned, for better or worse, a large aspect of their personality and, and their identity is constituted by, by being part of a nation. And I think it's unfortunate that in the 21st century, we cannot think of nationalism without it uh, being seen as being the equivalent 
of what the German Nazis did in the 1930s. It somehow immediately becomes as if somehow you know, a, a, a national sensibility is a slippery slope towards Kristallnacht. That's the kind of ideology that the European Union has put forward, which most um, people uh, with common sense are against. The other thing that uh, you know, I think is very much behind the movement uh, that I call populist is their belief in sovereignty. And I think it's interesting that in the 21st century, sovereignty in academic circles and the European circle, Euro circle is seen as a bad thing. Uh, I believe in sovereignty, and the reason why I believe in sovereignty is not because you know, I love the word or, 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 or I've got this phenomenal interest in, in, in national sovereignty. I believe in sovereignty for a very simple reason that uh, I learned through studying history that the only way that democratic rights and citizenship can mean anything is within a sovereign environment. In other words, popular sovereignty, which is the essence of democracy, is inextricably linked to national sovereignty. You cannot have democracy in the abstract. As Hannah Arendt, the political theorist, said, if we have non-sovereignty or, or globalism, then that, that represents the annihilation of public life. You can't even have a public sphere outside. Even a nation state is arguably a little bit too big uh, for, for exercising that. But as Hannah Arendt explains to us very eloquently, and Immanuel Kant you know, also understood this very, very clearly, the minute you, you move into this abstract federalist, globalist world, what you're left with is just the traces, the traces of anything that re resembles accountability, anything that could possibly resemble democracy. And I think it's very, very sad that the whole federalist project in the EU has created this uh, sensibility which is called cosmopolitan, but it's not cosmopolitan in the enlightenment sense of, of Immanuel Kant. It's got nothing to do with real cosmopolitanism, it's an empty globalism that allows you know, civic societies, as they're called, or NGOs, and techno technocrats to basically uh, sort of speak and make decisions on our behalf. So I think that's, that's something that is, is worth kind of remembering and is very, very uh, sort, of, uh, sort of powerful. And I think that there's two more things that people have reacted against. One is the erosion of the meaning of citizenship. It used to be a time when being a citizen actually meant that you, you, you had special rights and responsibilities and privileges. It meant that if you were a citizen of Britain or Holland, you had special, a special role to play that somebody coming in from uh, Brazil or Portugal, the United States didn't. And with the way that the immigration policies have been recast, you know, so what has happened is that not only uh, have people have come into your country, which is fine, I think that we we can, we can and interact with very many different kinds of people. But the argument has been is that people coming into your country have the same human rights as citizens as you do. And gradually, the uh, responsibilities and the privileges that are associated with citizenship have been flattened out. In other words, it has no meaning in circumstances where you as a citizen of a particular country have got certain special roles and, and affiliations that the fact that you lived in that country that your ancestors have lived in that country gives you a certain ways of, 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 of understanding the world and, and, and being uh, as opposed to somebody that has arrived yesterday morning. And I think that's something that also uh, is very important and unfortunately that is now seen as being racist, the fact that you insist that as somebody who, who, has a, who grew up in a particular village or a town or a city ought to be regarded differently or have a different relationship to that space than somebody who uh, arrives uh, out, out of nowhere. And the final thing, and I think this is uh, 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 the final element of the EU that people react against, is that the EU essentially has bought into the idea of the Thatcherist, Thatcherite idea of Tina. There is no alternative. Whether you're in Greece or in Hungary or in Italy, the uh, Brussels people tell you there is no alternative. This is the only way that the economy can run. There is no alternative. Of course, if you study politics, you will know that if there is no alternative, there's no politics. Right? I mean, politics is about choice. Politics is about being, being able to make decisions and, 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 and distinctions with different kinds of uh, alternatives. So I think that that aspect is quite important. The, the final thing that I think drives populism, and that's something that some of you might find very difficult to understand, especially if you live in the orbit of the EU, 
is that a lot of people feel patronized and held in contempt by the European Union. I think when I travel in East Europe, a lot of East European people think that the EU regards them as a bunch of stupid natives, uneducated. They haven't really come to terms with their past. They haven't really learned about democracy. They haven't got our sensitive, enlightened values. To use an American expression, these people in Poland and Hungary and other Romania are not aware. You know, they're not aware of all the incredible things that we're aware of uh, in, in, in the Western world. And I think that the, the language that people use, I, th I think that I find that really interesting because whenever I tell, whenever I defend populism, I was, I was involved in a debate recently defending populism. Immediately, you could tell that people were just dying to say, Frank, you're a bloody racist, you're a, you're a xenophobe, you're, you're just white trash, you're a scum, right? And because how can you have such horrible ideas? And in their eyes, you know, uh, you become almost like this kind of ipso facto racist. But when you look at their language, when you look at the words they use to describe the people that they don't like, you know, to me, that is actually uh, a language of contempt. It's a language of dehumanization. The anti-populist rhetoric dehumanizes the people they doesn't like. I think that Hillary Clinton summed that up beautifully when she called people she didn't like the deplorables. I think that's a really wonderful expression. These are the deplorables. But it isn't just Hillary Clinton. We had that in England, where Brexit voters were often denounced as being a low form of life, a kind of trailer trash, white trailer trash kind of individuals. And I thought it was very interesting that after the recent Italian elections, the old Italian oligarchs, you know, when you look at the words they use, there's a very interesting article uh, which in the Financial Times, which basically talked to a group of aristocrats and businessmen and cultural figures sitting over uh, uh, plates of spaghetti alla Nerano in a, in a Roman fancy uh, restaurant thinking about the elections, uh, and basically, you know, they're, they're talking about what, what has happened. And they're saying, you know, these people who won the elections, one lawyer says, they are beasts. Another one says, they're anthropologically different. A former central bank official says, I'm very scared for my country. These people are terribly ignorant. They have zero experience. And when you look at the language that they're kind of using, kind of left and right, what they, are, what they are really saying is that the Five Star Movements and the, uh, League, uh, the Northern League are basically a bunch of people that are kind of at a lower moral order. They're not like us. They kind of you know, inhabit a space which, is, which, which, which makes discussion and debate impossible. In other words, you know, I don't call them racist. You, know, you could if you wanted to. I call them intolerant. And if you look at the classical notion, what, a liberal notion of what tolerance is, they are intolerant. I find it very interesting that they call people illiberal, you know, uh, populists are meant to be illiberal, but they don't recognize their own illiberalism as being just as extreme. And just to end on, I think the, 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 the best thing about the new movements, probably the only really good thing about the new movements, is that it expresses a, a positive search for solidarity. I think that when you look at both the right wing and the left wing so-called populist people, when you talk to them, even when they're politically confused, even when they're just reacting in a defensive way, they really express a very human aspiration to come together, not to be atomized, not to be privatized, not to be just simply seen as a number, not to be just seen in a kind of, you know, sort of fragmented way. There's a real aspiration for coming together and for solidarity, and that's something that I think it's unfortunately we don't really recognize. And uh, to me, that seems to be the, the good message that comes out of populism. So what are we left with? I think what we're left with is a dilemma um, that someone like, I don't know how many of you are, are Dutch in this audience. I assume that most of you are, this is Amsterdam. But if you go back to Spinoza, who I think is in many respects the father of liberalism, of genuine, not what we call liberalism today, which is, you know, a zombie liberalism, but real liberalism. You know, Spinoza was struggling with the idea of how you reconcile the rule of law, the liberal ideals that he stood for, and the fact that you know, on occasions the majority of the Dutch people who were influenced by Calvinist religious ideals 
held views that were totally opposite to what he wanted to see. And he was totally upset about the fact that one of his heroes, John de Witt, who established the Dutch Republic, was actually massacred in, by the people on the streets of, of, of Amsterdam or wherever it was, Hague, yeah, um, uh, because, of the, because of their differences. And what he was really kind of struggling with is how do you reconcile majoritarian rule, majority and aspirations, with the fact that sometimes the majority of people make decisions that you think is wrong. Right? What do you do under those circumstances? And I think, to me, uh, what that really kind of speaks to is the fact that we gotta understand how democracy works, and not only try to understand how democracy works, but I think the challenge that we face in the 21st century is how to give democracy meaning. Because at the moment, democracy is seen in a very instrumental way as a means to an end, rather than what, um, what, 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 what a genuine Democrat would argue, which is that democracy is something that's good in and of itself, regardless of the outcome. Right? Regardless of how people vote, the very fact that people take place in the democratic process is a learning, educative, politicizing experience. And rather than blaming the people, for voting the wrong way or making the wrong decisions, we should blame ourselves for not having the arguments, the clarity, the sensibility with which to get people to, to kind of uh, support our particular kind of views. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much um, for a wonderful speech. Um, um, without notes, um, many Anglo-Saxons are very good at that, and, and, but you're especially good at it. It's a wonderful, wonderful speech about um, the populist turn, about the populist moment, you call it. And there's several, I mean, actually many things we could talk about, and several things I'd like to ask you. Um, I'm going to put the microphone a little bit more like this, because there are people at home watching as well. We send this, uh, we air it on the internet, so and they can't hear you if you don't speak into the microphone. Um, first, first, I would like to to come back a little bit to sorry, <laughs> a little bit um, uh, on the things you 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 you, you ended with, um, and then maybe ask you some more personal questions as well about your your endeavor or your your the uh, your development of your thoughts, and then turn to the public, see whether there's people wanting to join in, but. Um, you very eloquently told us um, how the populist moment came about. Um, there's many reasons for that. There's, um, you, you, you mentioned, um, for instance, the demise of sovereignty, um, the, the fact that you cannot be, be proud of your, of, of your heritage, of your, of your, 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 your country, your nation. Um, you said also the sort of the, the, um, the, the the depoliticization of many processes in it, the Tina effect, there's no alternative, there's no other, uh, other way. Um, and you made a very strong case for democracy as such and the political system in it. So if you depoliticize it, it becomes, um, uh, people um, um, uh, understand that they have nothing to say about it. So they, there's discontent growing. So, so you describe it uh, very eloquently and also the way uh, the people feel that they're looked down upon. Um, I was, well, let's start with, um, with the, the idea of, um, um, the idea of, the, I mean, I, I'm wondering because you're ending your speech with the only good thing which comes out of it, <laughs> of the populist moment, might be this looking for solidarity, that it's a, a way to, to, to look for solidarity by the left wing and right wing populist. So, just to be clear, um, you describe it, it's happening, it's due to uh, the political elites for, to a large extent, but you're not happy with it. Is that true? Well, this is not a situation of my own making. Mm -hmm. uh, no, of course not. Yeah, and, and I think that, uh, you know, sort of, uh, we live in a world where, uh, because of the uh, political tensions that have erupted, mm -hmm. um, the big difference is the big debates are cultural, mm -hmm. so, which is why I wrote the book about the culture wars. It's really about conflicting kind of cultural values. 
And in, the, in this kind of cultural debate, you know, sort of, uh, I find myself in a very difficult position. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got to say that I'm balanced in this culture war, you know, which is the side that en best encapsulates what I say as being the values of the Enlightenment, of the Renaissance, of what I say as being the positive legacy of Western civilization. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. A couple of months ago, I did a, a lecture in Timoswar or Temeswar, if you're mm -hmm. Hungarian, in Romania. And it was about this subject, you know, sort of, uh, and it was a wonderful uh, uh, event because we had Hungarian, Romanian, you know, Bulgarian, Polish, all kinds of young lawyers from East Europe there, really smart people, young kids. Um, and afterwards, you know, sort of, uh, I was grabbed by some of the students, and I, there was one student in particular that really, you know, sort of told me something that I'm still thinking about. And he says, well, you know, I'm really glad you, you, you said, I'm really glad what you said, Frank, because people don't understand how populism and the Enlightenment and liberalism can be seen as, as a coherent alternative. And I, I had this problem. I said, what was your problem? I said, well, in Budapest, I was talking to one of my professors, my law professors, and we were talking about this debate about the gay cake. Do you know about the debate about the gay cake, yeah. which has been going on everywhere in the Anglo-American? Basically, what happened is that you have a, a, in America and in, in, England, in, in Ireland, you had groups of homosexuals you know, uh, going to Christian bakers, asking them to make a cake celebrating their marriage as gay people, right? And you have both sides claiming that you know, on the one side, they're saying, I've got my religious freedom to do as I like. And the other side saying, as a gay person, why should I not have the right to uh, get you to make me the cake that I want? And the student was telling me uh, that, you know, uh, when I was discussing with my professor, I said what I think is the, the genuinely liberal thing, which is that they're both right. In other words, they're both right. They, they, you know, in, in a civilized world, you know, they would resolve this in a, in a kind of amicable way because, you know, gay people have the right to insist, you know, that people recognize their right to have, a, have their marriage celebrated mm -hmm. by, by a cake. And similarly, you know, sort of Christian people have, have the, the right, right to a religious yeah, sure. conscience. Yeah. And so I thought that was great. I, you know, finally I meet someone that thinks like me. And he says, uh, the unfortunate thing was that the, my professor said, you're wrong, there's only one way. Right. There's only one answer here. The gay people were right. The Christians were wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of intolerance, which mm -hmm. we have, in a, which is what a culture war is really all about, mm -hmm. you know, where you don't have any compromise, you don't, you don't really recognize that at the end of the day, mm -hmm. there are some important ideals that both sides have. You got to choose sides, and yeah. I and I choose the side that I think is you know, is is going to be most likely to uh, embrace what I see as positive democratic rights and, mm -hmm. and, and what I see as being more right, even though they're not necessarily uh, believing things that I believe in, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, and which is why, for example, latterly I've been defending Christians, even though I'm an atheist, I'm, I'm not even Christian, you know, sort of, uh, and their right to conscience. I even defended Christian people who are against abortion, mm -hmm. even though my wife's the biggest abortion provider in Britain. I think, you know, if you choose not to allow abortion, then that should be a right. And I think that, you know, as, as, a, as an old-fashioned liberal, I think in this kind of, you know, kind of culture, well, you've got you to choose sides. And I think that uh, on balance, I think the European Union oligarchy is in the wrong, and I think the people that are reacting against them represent the, the positive future. So that's okay, okay. So, so um, that's interesting. So you're saying, um, so you actually said, well, maybe the only good thing which is coming out of the popular movement is solidarity, but you're saying, no, it's, it's more than that. It's if I have to choose sides, um, then I would choose the populist, although um, they might be against some other things. I, uh, do you think you have to choose sides? Is it, is it, is it, is, are we in a moment in which there's, uh, it's digital? Because you could argue, of course, in a normal liberal society, the, the Christian baker uh, could be all right, and the homosexual couple could be all right because they go to the next bakery. And so you can have both. Yes. And the next bakery is an atheist and has no, no problem. Yes. So, I mean, you don't have to choose in a civil, in a liberal society maybe, or do you have to? Are we in the moment in which we do have to side? Well, well, well not always. Um, 
And I think that, you know, which is why I don't always choose sides. I think there mm -hmm. are, but there are certain issues that are very fundamental. And I think that on balance, sometimes, you know, and that, it's not something I'm always very happy with, but the way that I look at it, if you take free speech, it's a very good example. Uh, historically, uh, people that were in the forefront of advocating free speech and freedom of expression were people that used to be called left wing. I mean, the, the left and the radical movement were the ones that were pushing for freedom of press, yeah. freedom of expression. You've been involved in that yourself. Yes, no? yes, that's, that's, that's the way. It, yeah. In the 21st century, it's the other way around. And very often it's conservative, you know, right wing people who are doing that. Now, they probably are doing it for selective reasons. I think both sides were very selective because obviously, if you're Christian and you feel that your religion has got less scope for expression, you will want free speech. Right. It, it might not be a principled defense of free speech, a practical but one. you will yeah. still want free speech for that. So we, had a, we have a reversal that has occurred where in many respects, the, you know, historically, the left was much more for democracy uh, and, and, and it was the conservative kind of Catholic church and everything else that were most anti-democratic. And I think there's been a reversal here. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to recognize that while, while also being objective enough to know that that doesn't mean that they've become converted to Spinoza, John Locke, Mills, and you know, all the other things. But this is the way that these things are at the moment. So yes, there on principle, on, on many principal things you have to choose. But then, but then, um, then we move into uh, uh, elections now in the, in the, in the, the first, first uh, second decade of the 21st century, in which we have elections like recently in Italy. And we have now a new government just installed. And one of the first things uh, today the Italian Minister of Interior said is that he will deport Roma and Sintai people without a passport. Um, and alas, we have to keep on to the ones who have an Italian passport. That's one of the first things he does when he becomes an elected member of a, a populist party, a populist government. So you immediately move into these sort of well-known waters of excluding people of another ethnic um, kind who are not as Italian as other Italians. So there it becomes very principled, of course, again, suddenly. How do you, if, because they might as well move into waters you don't want to be in. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> you got to react to the specifics. Uh, sure. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that uh, the, the Northern League has got a, a monopoly on being anti-Roma in Hungary. For example, the, the left-wing government was far worse with the Roma people mm -hmm. than the current Fidesz government is. And if you look at the, uh, the record, you know, of what happened there and the kind of um, insensitivity and, 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 the, uh, and, and the propaganda that was waged against, uh, you know, sort of people under the old socialist government was far more insidious. So I, I think that, you know, what people like us have got to do is to basically uh, take a stand on each of the specific kind, mm -hmm. of, kind of issues. Yeah. I mean, that's an issue I feel very strongly about. The first political thing I ever did in my life was at the age of nine, I got kicked out of school because I saw some children throwing stones at some Roma, pe a Roma woman. And I intervened to kind of try to protect her, going to fight. And uh, next day, my teachers called my mother in and said, your son is not allowed to school go to school for a week. And the proudest moment I had in my life was my mother looked at me and said, you know, Frank, I'm really proud of you. Let's go to the pastry shop and you can eat as many pastries as you can. Yeah. So for me, that was always a, a visceral kind of reaction. And, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not doubting your, I mean, not at all. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just trying to, to get to the, to, I understand. And I know this anecdote, um, I know that you're yourself of Jewish descent and, one, and you know, many of your family, of your father's family were murdered and your mother's family was in Bergen Bells. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doubting that at yeah. all. No, I'm trying to get to the, uh, uh, to the point in which if you think that, for instance, populist and that, that the, the, the sort of the populist who are really interested in sovereignty and national sovereignty or national descent, and like you described them, um, uh, are interested in their own Catholic often values in Central Europe, and it's understandable, it's nothing. But um, then there comes this moment when, of course, it becomes one nation under God, and then it becomes all the sort of the same ethnicity, and it becomes, the, and, it, and that's, that's sometimes very near. So wouldn't you be afraid if you say, well, if the defining um, 
uh, um, a level of political organization is the nation state, that we end up you know, in these sort of circumstances very quickly again. Well, well not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, you have to remember that nationalism and, and the idol nation state mm -hmm. emerges with the French Revolution. Right? And, and the French Revolution... A bit earlier, maybe, sometimes, but yeah. No, I mean, you know, that's, that's when it kicks in. You know, the, the, the people, you know, the first time they, the people are mentioned as a, as, a, as a homogeneous unity in the French Revolution. I don't think anybody would argue that the French Revolution was a reactionary kind of phenomenon. It represented, it opened up the world to, to radicalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you look at the 1848 national revolutions, you know, liberalism you know, sort of emerges out of that within large parts of Central Europe. So there are, you know, the, you know nationalism is highly specific. And if it, if it, if it uh, leads to what, we, what you know, one would call being you know, reactionary, xenophobic consequences. Yeah, ethno nationalism. Or, I, would, I would argue it's not the nationalism that, like, okay, but there's other circumstances that mm -hmm. account for that. The, the one thing that I think uh, we need to uh, understand, which is very difficult to grasp, but in, in many respects, you know, some of what you would see as the unattractive features of populist movements, I see as being the, the mirror image of the people that they react against. Mm -hmm. I think there's a right. kind of no. caricature. You know, in other words, if, if you've been told long enough that you're a xenophobe and you're a racist, then you, after a while, you say, well, screw you. You know, I'm a xenophobe and a racist. And you I'm, see that in America, yeah. where Americans have been told you know, you've got white privilege. If people who, whenever we knew that they were white, all of a sudden have white privilege, this and you know, this new idea of whiteness, and you should feel guilty. About. So all these people who have been told that they are, they're these disgusting white people, then get up in the morning and they say, yeah, I, I'm white. So you have the alt-right. And I think the alt-right in America uh, is, is, is really what you get when you treat, when you talk down to people in this particular no, kind of way. I understand, but, but you, that's, that's, that's obvious. You, you say, well, you explain how it comes about. And of course, explaining is something, and understanding that process is something different than thinking it's a good idea. And I'm, I'm trying to get at that. You know, how, well, how, how far do you think it's a good idea to... Um, well, well, it's not far. I mean, national sovereignty <coughs> is, is the foundation of democracy. Mm -hmm. So it's a good idea. Now, how people use democracy, what mm -hmm. they make of it, is something that's an open question. And I think that uh, if democracy leads to uh, decisions and, and policies that are wrong, then it's not the fault of the democracy. It's not the fault of national sovereignty. Mm -hmm. It's the fault of the fact that the public life in that particular domain, or the poli politicians in there, are you know have got it wrong and, and are opportunistically manipulating or using various kind of phenomena. Okay. But we do need to make it because the alternative is no democracy, no national sovereignty, and then what, and then what you're left with is a result that's far worse, because that a technocratic form of oligarchical domination can never be changed. A democratic form of decision that's wrong can be changed because you have elections, you have people that are accountable to you. Mm -hmm. And what if um, uh, the democratic process is hijacked in order to um, um, uh, never to be reinstalled, in order to the democratic process never to be reinstalled? Yes. I mean, the, the, the wonderful and the, and the threatening thing about democracy is that it's a risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what uh, the Greeks recognized this in ancient Greece, that when you allow people to vote, you don't know what the outcome is. It's a real risk. And I think that, to me, is the buzz. I think that uh, the risk uh, of, of democracy is also an opportunity because it means that if you trust people, if you, if you talk to people like grown-ups rather than children, then there's always a possibility of, of a positive transformation. If you deny it to them, mm -hmm. then I think you end up with a worse result. And, uh, and if democracy or a state is going to be hijacked, it will be easier to hijack a state for, for uh, negative consequences much easier if there's no democracy. I think that that's what the lesson of history is. The more you limit democracy, the more you confine democracy, the more you're going to end up with regressive, destructive consequences. So, so you would say we should be, we ought to be more afraid of the technocrats than of the populists? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, 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 my first conviction is that I believe in people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to have, uh, as, 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 hu as humanists, which I, I, I identify as being, we have, have to have a fundamental belief that people have a capacity to learn from their experience. And on a good day, human beings will do the right thing. 
Uh, again, Hannah Arendt makes the point in her writings is that it doesn't happen. Good days don't happen every day, no. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> you know, and, and, and sometimes they're very rare. But for all that, we have to be able to you know, sort of look towards that rather than foreclose the possibility. Mm -hmm. To come back to, I mean, you mentioned Hannah Arendt and you, you mentioned uh, Immanuel Kant on the sovereignty thing. You said, well, a nation state is probably already almost too big as an entity to have a, a real uh, a democratic process, political process going on. But I'm just wondering uh, about that, because it, that's an interesting argument about the European Union, of course, and about you know, how big <coughs> and how small things ought to be. Um, um, because you mentioned the French Revolution, France in those days was humongous, it was huge. I mean, you had to travel for days and days uh, to, to, to other big towns. Um, in that respect, the European Union, I mean, the world has shrunk, of course. So uh, Immanuel Kant wrote his Zum Ewigen Frieden, a wonderful essay on what you could call something like a vision of the European Union in order to prevent war between the states. Um, um, I don't quite see why, why the the size um, of the nation state, um, uh, you could have a nation state as big as Europe, um, uh, which, I mean, then you have to reform, maybe do something about the political process. I, I see your point about the, U the, the European Bank, you know, deciding all sorts of things. So it's not an uh, entirely grown up democracy. But the size, I don't get that. I mean, wh why wouldn't you be able to get a, um, uh, America functions very well, India functions sort of very well as a democracy. Um, what's well, the point? I mean, I don't see that size well, argument. I think, I think you have a point. I think size is not the decisive element in here. Uh, I think sovereignty is. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, you know, sort of, uh, I think that sovereignty is best exercised within more confined spaces. But I, I agree with you. I think that if the European Union had remained true to its founding principles, which was the diversity of nations, rather than some, you know, what it has become, which is diversity now means something very different, then I think that you could have had a different uh, form of accountability. Mm -hmm. Because I think the key thing about sovereignty is not the size, okay. but how you exercise, uh, 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 how citizens are able to hold people to account, mm -hmm. how they can have a, an interactive relationship with their representatives. And I think that uh, the question that becomes, how do you give sovereignty meaning now, the European Union have this, uh, this kind of technocratic phase called shared sovereignty. But shared sovereignty basically means that the oligarchs in different countries you know, have a you know, kind of a collaborative relationship with each other. It doesn't mean that you know, a Dutch person or an English person is holding you know, sort of Juncker to account you know, or, or, or the European Commission to account because they exist above that. So mm -hmm. my argument is really about sovereignty rather than about size. Yeah, I just yeah, yeah. happen to make the point that you know, from, from a technical point of view, okay. you know, sort of uh, size does matter. Sort of, <laughs> to use in, in many aspects, expression. size does matter. <laughs> but, um, but, um, um, but it's, it's funny that you call it the oligarchs in Brussels, huh? because if you look at the, the world outside the union, the union is, um, is a democracy. We have the right to vote. Um, and if you look at the world outside it, uh, to uh, the oligarchization um, of the world, um, the Saudi princes, the oil magnates in uh, under Putin, um, the, 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 the Sultan of uh, uh, Brunei, and the American Jeff Bezos and, and, and Zuckerberg. I mean, it's very big outside the Union, outside Europe. So Europe is a countervailing power or mitigating power towards the oligarchization we see all over the world. So that would sort of, in a way, point that it is functioning because it, it still has sort of a, a mitigating influence on the oligarchization which we see all over the world due to the internet, due to the oil, due to the sort of semi-regimes around us. Well, I think that... So in that respect, it would not, it, it's not doing such a bad job, maybe. <laughs> well, I, I think oligarchs come in all shapes and sizes. If I was sure. an American, mm -hmm. I'd be really angry at the Gates Foundation or the mm -hmm. Soros Foundation, all these different mm -hmm. philanthropists. I mean, Gates... Yeah, yeah you could call them oligarchs, sure. Yeah. Gates literally uh, has managed to change the curriculum of American education without ever being voted or having been elected as an individual. He's got decisive influence 
over the textbooks and the curriculum that children learn by. And I don't think that's a, a good thing for any, a single individual with lots of money to be able to do. And I think if you look at the American uh, uh, oligarchs, they ex exercise a baneful influence on uh, American public life. I think that you know, we have different kinds of oligarchs in Russia and in Eastern Europe. They're, you know, they're the old nomenclatura that's become privatized, and I'm not very happy with them either. You know, their, their, their role is, is, is not one that's good for public life. And I think we have, a, we have in, in, in places like Western Europe also an oligarchy that, that's composed of a, what, what, for lack of a better way, word, you can use a cultural elite, a, a political establishment, mm -hmm. you know, who, are, who have a system of organizations, you know, who are able to determine political and cultural life. And I think that they, they, uh, until now, they've been able to get away with a lot. And I think it's only because for the first time they've been challenged that you've got all this hysteria about populism. I think that for the first, for the first time they realize that they are being challenged. And I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, 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 hate, I hate to use the word elite because I have I got no problem with elites. I think it's, you have sporting elites, you have people who are very good in culture. You have good writers. No yeah. problem <laughs> yeah. with, with people who are excellent in their areas. What I do have a problem with is this very unrepresentative group that is able to have an, an, a disproportionate influence on public affairs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, were you surprised to find you writing this book? I mean, actually, you say, say so in the first pages that in a way you were surprised to find yourself on the side of um, very Catholic um, <laughs> people in Central Europe. Um, it wouldn't be sort of the... Um, when did you first realize that, that, that... Did you think you shifted your opinions from sort of an international socialist, or is, it, or is it just that the world changed? And you stayed true to a lot of your original ideas? Well, well, well the context changes. Mm -hmm. um, the world changes. I, I, I see myself as not all that different than I was, except that uh, the world has changed, politics has changed, uh, the issues at stake have changed quite fundamentally. And I, I have changed in, in two important respects. I think. When I was younger, I didn't realize the importance of sovereignty, mm -hmm. national and popular. I think those two things have, you know, have been very important for me to reevaluate the way that I see the world. Not because I've got strong national feelings, because I'm not really anything. I'm not, you know, I, I lived in England, Hungary. I'm, I'm European, basically. But nevertheless, I, I, I think that national and popular sovereignty are really important and they're quite inter interconnected. <clears throat> I think that's been one important change in, 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 in the way that I look at it. And, and secondly, I think in many respects, uh, uh, I, I, unlike in the past, I really learned to appreciate the importance of uh, reappropriating the, the, the resources of liberalism, because I think we live in a very intolerant in, in kind of world. So I think that has become much more important to me uh, than has been the case at the moment. But I, I, in other respects, uh, I think the reason why I wrote that book was an accident. It, it basically, what happened was that I, I, you know, I stayed away from Hungary and East Europe as much as I could um, for a number of personal reasons to do with the fact that I'd left and I didn't want to kind of butt in. But then I heard all the stories about Hungary. You know, like you know, the, the, the stories here about Hungary is that anti-Semitism is so strong that it's just almost impossible if you're Jewish. Well, all that I can say is that if you go to a Budapest uh, you go to Budapest, and you have flourishing Jewish cultures and Jewish restaurants in Budapest, unlike in Brussels or in Paris, don't have police guards in front of them, right? People come, yeah, come and go. And, you know, you go, you know, I remember being in Antwerp, you know, sort of uh, in, near, going near a, a Jewish place, and it's full of policemen. So you go to Malmo, and if you're a Jew in Malmo, you feel a lot more uncomfortable in Berlin than you would do in Budapest. And I think that there's a kind of hysterical double standard there. You have stories about the Hungarian media. According, according to the stories you hear, the Hungarian media is, does not allow uh, any oppositional views. But all I can say is that the left-wing media in, in, in Hungary is far more interesting and influential than in England. You know, sort of, and, and uh, you know, sort of, there are media laws in Hungary. As, as a free speech advocate, I'm totally against any interference in the media. But the fact that they are, the assumption that there's a kind of a worst situation there compared to the West is a myth. And I could go on and on and on and on about the way in which, you know, Hungary builds a fence, you know, sort of uh, uh, with Serbia. That's not allowed. You know, that's horrible to build a fence. 
But when you know the, the, the Baltic republics build a fence with the Russia, that's cool, that's all right. Or when the Swedes build a, a fence, you know, that's all right. So uh, that got me really angry because I just felt there's a really fundamental double standard there. You know, and it's not that Hungarians are angels or beautiful people. They have plenty of problems. But I think that the, the stories about Hungary, I just think, are fundamentally flawed. So I wrote that book. And then I found myself getting involved in a territory that I never wanted to go into, wasn't particularly interested in. But once I was there, I wasn't going to you know, sort of back off. It's not, it's not your character. Right? No, 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 definitely not. <laughs> Did you feel um, uh, Hungarian in a, way, in a way because your family left in, 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 uh, during the, uh, uh, right after the uprising, the Hungarian uprising in 1956? Um, but explaining Hungary to the world, did you feel suddenly a bit Hungarian to explain what's happening there to the world? Well, not immediately, uh, because I, I, like I said, you know, I left when I was very young, a nine-year-old. And I spoke Hungarian like an intelligent nine-year-old, so it wasn't mm -hmm. very sophisticated. Uh, and, I, and I've been out of there. And, I, and then I started going back there. And in fact, I gave my first ever lecture in Hungarian a few months ago. And as I was giving the lecture in Hungarian, I realized that actually I am Hungarian, which I never imagined I was. My sense of humor is a Hungarian sense of humor. I mean, maybe it's not a sense of humor, but what, you know, what I see as a sense of humor is Hungarian rather than English or French or anything else. And then I realized emotionally I am, but at the same time, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that I'm not Hungarian because I, I've lived a, a different kind of experience and I see the world a little bit differently than, than they did. Huge arguments with Hungarians who, are, who like what I've written in the book, but we still have huge arguments about a lot of other things because my perspective is very different than they are. So, you know, I suppose in that sense, I do identify with Spinoza because as an alien, from, I mean, he's somebody that the Jews kicked out because he wasn't Jewish enough. He was never accepted here or there. He just basically found himself beached in the middle of nowhere. I, I feel that way. But I'm balanced. I feel much more Hungarian now than I ever felt, which is not a bad thing, I suppose, as I get old. You know, so in my declining years, it's good to have some kind of links with the, with, with the world. But then again, coming back to Orban, I mean, um, um, I was in Hungary not too long ago, and we had a, a European Press Prize event there, and we handed out a press prize, and there were a lot of Hungarian journalists in the audience, and they, um, and there was a speech by an old um, uh, um, dissident from the 80s, who by now was an emeritus professor, and you know denounced the laws of Viktor Orban, whom he knew very well because in the 80s they were both dissidents together, and he said, you know, I can't understand why my old buddy who was a dissident now, you know, um, and he was. I mean, he was explaining things. It was not very, very radical, I would have said. But, you know, he was opposing the laws of Viktor Orban. And, and, and there were many Hungarian journalists in the audience who said, would I have known that he would be speaking like this? I would not have come. I agree with him, but I can't be here because it would cost me my job. I was, this was earlier this year. Um, I was really shocked about that. Yeah, I think a lot of Hungarians yeah. Uh, in Budapest are drama queens. You know, I, I get that in England. I, I, I give you a story which I, I think is very similar. Uh, the morning after Brexit, I wrote an article in the Times Higher Educational Supplement saying that as, as the only sociologist probably in England that voted for Brexit, you know, this is how I saw the situation. Look, a lot, and I made fun of the fact that my university looked like a clinic the day after. Everybody was crying and everything else. <laughs> And the next day, after I wrote the article, I got about 20, 25 emails from other professors saying, Frank, I'm really glad you spoke out that you, that you were for Brexit. We also voted for Brexit, Brexit, but we're too scared to admit that to our colleagues in the university. It will cost our jobs. And my reaction was to say, look, you're not living in Stalinist Russia or in Hitler's Germany. No, you have to Speak out and say that you were for, you know, for Brexit, and we need more of you to, to say that. And I think Hungarian journalists have said are very similar because, you know, uh, if you open your mouth, if you uh, stand, I, I know a lot of Hungarians who are very brave and very bold. They say very unpopular opinions, you know, sort of, and they haven't been sent to concentration camps yet, you know. And I think that there is a kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, drama queen kind of attitude that has developed among the section of the Hungarian intelligentsia, which bears no relationship to, go to a bookshop. All I can tell people, go to a bookshop and see what kind of books they sell there. And you'll find that most of the books they sell there tend to be um, anti-government, they tend to be oppositional, they tend to 
tend to reflect the, the preoccupations of the Hungarian intelligentsia. And that's in the, you know, that is the reality, rather than the, that you've got to hide your books and you've got to you know, pretend that you, know, you, you, you support Orban when you don't. I think that things are much, much, much more dynamic than that. There, there is a problem in East Europe, which is that you do have, as, as, as you did in the old government, you know, sort of some of the old problems of nepotism, some of the old problems of favoritism, some of the old politicking. But that was the socialist government as well, I and mean, that's nothing new. It's regrettable, but that is, unfortunately, what happens when you have a transition to a new regime, which is from above rather than from below. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for uh, this frank conversation up until now. Um, um, I'm wondering whether there's people by now wanting to join in, to comment, to ask, to um, add, but other, ah. There's, I, I come to you with a microphone that's nicer for the people at home. Um, we can hear you, but at home is nicer. How do you perceive the uh, rise of the new politicians in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, for instance, Babish, the Czech Trump. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, well, I, I think that uh, they really reflect a, an, an underlying problem. I think that in, in the Czech Republic or in Slovakia or other places, the old parties have just you know, disintegrated quite a bit. And what you're left with are individuals coming to the fore. I'm, I'm always very uncomfortable when you have individuals emerging, you know, sort of without necessarily any party political credentials without a, any kind of clear political program, but just as a pers person, because uh, that, that is not a good way, good way of, for democracy to evolve. And what I really worry about is that when everything depends on this one individual, uh, you know, you can never trust a single individual because, you know, at the end of the day, they just simply, uh, you know, aren't rooted organically in any kind of tradition or culture or movement. So I do find that a little bit disturbing, as I do the Macron phenomenon, which is very similar. I mean, we have, we have that personalization of politics everywhere, uh, on, on, you know, on all sides of the political spectrum. And I think as, as Democrats, we need to be suspicious of that highly personalized Bonapartist uh, political phenomenon. Well, I'm not sure if he's gained his money. Is uh, um, uh, uh, excuse me, how do you know how he made this money? He, uh, well, I read about it, so it's I'm a, questioning it, it, myself. It, it, well. So, but you can also see it from a positive side. I mean, has, he is a self-made man. He could also serve as an example for for other people. I'm I, I'm just questioning. I'm not. You mean, yeah. you mean like Berlusconi or Trump? Or, yeah. Hmm? No. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean. I, I understand that. I think that the only good thing about the Czech election was that it wiped out some of the old parties. I think that's a good thing, because I think those parties had let down you know, the Czech people quite fundamentally. I wish they had new parties uh, that had emerged. Uh, but myself, uh, learning from history, I always say I never trust individuals, no matter, even if they're God's gift to humanity, uh, they are too unreliable, and, and, and they basically serve to kind of uh, depoliticize and personalize public life. So that's what I'm really uncomfortable with. Yeah, just, it's just uh, without any judgment, a technical remark. I come from Slovakia and uh, 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 Prime Minister, or designed Prime Minister ba Babiš is, uh, lived his whole life is, is a Slovak. And he is exactly one of the example of the oligarchs who came to his uh, uh, really big, big em empire, economic empire, thanks uh, one of those who were uh, st st state police st structure, who understood, who were clever enough and understood soon enough how to make big money. So this is a self-made man <laughs> in a Central European way. So this is a self-made manship. But the other thing is that, uh, yes, it, it, it did not disqualify him, make him ineligible to gain the trust of the Czech uh, audience, of the Czech public. 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there are very few self-made millionaires in East Europe because, uh, uh, unfortunately, most of the people that are self-made in East Europe are part of the nomenclatura that became privatized, that have benefited from plundering the, the resources that existed. And, and it seems to me that's, that, that's part and parcel of that. And I think um, that was the case with the old socialist parties and, and, and their friends who disproportionately benefited from that. And that continues to be the case at the moment. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the key issue for the future of public life is not what an individual is like, whether they're self-made or not. I think it's whether they really represent something that can express the aspirations, give voice to the needs of the people. And, and for that, you need more than one individual. You need to have a movement that can do something like that. Yes, because we have been talking about um, populism in Europe quite, quite a lot. But if you, um, if you turn that around to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, to Trump or to, or to Italy, uh, to Berlusconi, would you say that these sort of um, businessmen who, who sort of suddenly became um, statesmen that they're part of the populist movement, or are they not? Are they something different? Yeah, I mean, I, I would not, I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm very uncomfortable with the populist label anyway. Yeah, I, I understand uh, that. Yeah, You're but, right, but I, I, yeah. Think, I think that yeah. Berlusconi is really the, the new establishment, or was the new establishment within Italy itself, who used the resources available to the Italian oligarchy. It was, it was an integral member of the old Italian oligarchy who tried to appear to be new and tried to present himself as somehow a novel solution. I mean, his big uh, he argument- He tried, but he, he managed he, he, to he did. pull it off. But, but his big <laughs> argument was that I'm anti-political. That was the big message. Yes, yeah, yeah, we're anti-political. So basically, the moment I hear the word anti-political, I switch off because I know what they are really saying is we don't take you, public life and politics seriously, you know, sort of, and it becomes a performance, a kind of a, a public relations performance. And, and I do think that to call, to see Berlusconi as, as representing the same aspirations as the Five Star Movement mm -hmm. is, is fundamentally flawed. I think whatever you think of the Five Star Movement, or even for the Northern League, whatever you think of them, the people that have voted for them and, and, and what they see in them is something very, very different. And would you put Trump into the Berlusconi camp or in the Five Star Movement camp? I, th I think that... I mean, it's difficult maybe to answer, but... It, but it is difficult. Uh, uh, I, I, again, yeah. if you look at the American elections, the only good thing about the American election was that Hillary Clinton lost. I think that was, that was a good result. It's a tragedy that, that Trump had won, you know, that, 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 that Trump was the only alternative to that. But I think that you know, what the election revealed was the Democratic Party has disintegrated. It, it becomes emptied of meaning. I probably would have liked Bernie Sanders to have done better. You know, that would have been just like I would have rather had Melanchon in France doing a little bit better. That would have been pretty good. But I think that Trump did represent you know, a, a particular sentiment that's similar to, in one respect to Europe, which is a lot, a lot of the Trump supporters that I've talked to basically said that they were sick and tired of being talked down to. I mean, that was the common denominator. They really hated being treated like white trash. I mean, mm -hmm. that was the, the you know, and that, that to me is the fault of people like Clinton and, 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 and others rather than of anything else. And I think we, what we're left with is a very unsatisfactory political result. Um, I think the interesting thing is that come the midterm elections in America, the Democrats you know, are still not able to get a party together because of, of, of their own track record. Um, yeah. More, more um, questions, yes. So uh, I just have a uh, question is, you know, um, so you were saying that, um, you know, on a good day, um, people will vote for what is right and on a bad day, perhaps they won't. And we should accept that. But um, isn't that saying somewhere that um, the democratic process is more important than its outcome? Am yes, I right? Absolutely. I, I think. It's a bit like free speech. I believe in free speech because even if my arguments lose, when people exercise their right to voice their, their views and their sentiments, that becomes an educative process in society. Even if I lose, I will learn from people's arguments. And I think society gains intellectual clarity through that process. I think democracy is the same thing. Through, democ through the exercise of democratic rights, um, 
especially when you have individuals with clear views that they present to the public, I think that society will learn from that. And it may well be that we have a setback, the wrong people get elected. But I think you know, for people to go through that experience is really important. And if, if, if we have a bad result in democracy, that's an argument for people like ourselves to do a, bit, a little bit better next time. You see, it's very easy to blame the people. They really, I mean, if you go into a Washington bookshop at the moment, I just been there a couple of months ago, on the table, the, the, the best sellers in, in the bookshops are all books that say democracy is wrong, the critical of democracy. You have books by Jason Bennett that says people should have to pass a test before they're allowed to vote. Other people are saying in these books that people need to, you know, the world is too complex for people to be able to make decisions that, 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 and so you have all these books basically saying, forget about democracy. And the reason why they're saying it is because of all the bad results that they see from their point of view. For me, I think that what that tells us is that we've got to take democracy more seriously and actually believe in it. Because I think the real problem has been is that despite all the rhetoric about democracy, in Europe, the political classes didn't really believe in it. They were opportunistically, instrumentally using democracy for a particular kind of purpose, rather than realizing that actually people coming together and debating and discussing and arguing is in and of itself a positive development. But, but, but I mean, the outcome is important in the end, of, of course. course. And yeah. um, um, yes, I can see your argument. You have to, if you believe in a democracy, you have to take it seriously, of course. So you have to listen to the people. I mean. Uh, uh, and what they vote, but um, you have like a shining example of Erdogan using what? Erdogan, Erdogan in Turkey, yeah. using you know, all perfectly legitimate democratic processes. And he said so long time ago, you know, democracy is a train we will get off, you know, by the time we arrived. Um, but I mean, that is a sort of a, a, a very nasty outcome. <laughs> well, Erdogan happens to be one of the few people in Europe mm -hmm. that's got convictions that is, it resembles what we used to call a statesman, you know, that is serious. It isn't just simply wavering from one side to the other. I don't like him at all. I don't like his politics. But, you know, the, the problem in Turkey is the opposition, you know, who are conspicuously feeble and weak. But having said that, you know, as long as there's democracy, there's a very good chance that Erdogan will lose. And as you know, in the coming elections in Turkey, the, the gap between Erdogan and the opposition has really, really narrowed. And I think that, you know, for me, if Erdogan loses in the election, that will demonstrate the, the power of democracy. Now, fair, it, point, you know, fair point. <laughs> you know, sort of, so we should be if, open. If he loses, of course. Well, but, he, yeah. look, look at the opinion polls. It is very, very close at the moment. Now, you know, if he has a coup to prevent that from happening, that's, the problem is not democracy. The problem, the problem is, is the coup, the coup, of course. Yeah. And Turkey has yeah. had many, many coups even before democracy. So it's not, a, it's not democracy that creates coups. It's bad people. Sure. 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 A, a very simple question. I, uh, I share this admiration uh, for the democratic process, uh, but I do think that the result is important, as you think, and that's why I want to ask you your opinion. Is Viktor Orban a Democrat? Well, he calls himself an, an illiberal Democrat. That's what he kind of calls himself. Uh, I think, I think that he's, he is as much a Democrat as Macron or as uh, uh, Theresa May or most of his politicians. I don't think he's a conviction Democrat like I am. In other words, for him, uh, like most political leaders, democracy is probably not seen as a, as a, as a good in and of, of himself. But in terms of if you look at the, uh, you look at the process, uh, Hungarian democracy is as democratic as in most other places, I, you know, in, in most kind of European societies. I think Viktor Orban is a phenomenally clever politician. Uh, he's a natural leader. He's the only Hungarian politician who actually stood up in the old communist, Stalinist regime and basically called the regime. To, all the other politicians were too scared to open their mouth. He, he opened his mouth, which is why he gets his legitimacy from. Uh, and he's is very, very clever in terms of uh, playing the, the political game. Viktor Orban is very, very lucky, very, very fortunate in that his opponents are singularly idiotic. You know, he, there is no opposition in Hungary. It hasn't been for a very, very long time. 
So uh, unlike Erdogan, who faces real opposition opponents, in, in Hungary, there is no such thing. They're, they, are a, they are a joke and they're an embarrassment to the word opposition. So yeah, I mean, I, I think the problem with Orban is that he is, he in this, in, 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 as, as they say, in the, uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king in Hungary. You know, sort of, there is nobody else. You know, so as long as that, that occurs, he will play this incredibly uh, important role. Are there more and more questions? I don't know whether we can have everybody. Um, one of the points in your book is um, tradition, and you say that Viktor Orban um, goes back to an, a tradition which he in part invents, and you say that the problem with the EU is that it is an institution without tradition. So I was wondering if you wanted to expand on that and whether there is any reason why Eastern Europe in particular seems to be getting this kind of, you know, um, anti um, or very snobbish attitude from, from, from many people at the moment, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, in, in Hungary, tradition matters. I'm, I'm not a traditionalist myself. But I can really understand that for, for people, the legacy of the past plays a very, very important role. Uh, their language, their culture, their religion, uh, their moral framework becomes really quite important. Whereas in Western Europe, we talk about the past as the bad old days. We kind of leave everything behind. Everything that's new is, by definition, good. You know, in, in England, for example, we tell uh, parents that they shouldn't allow the, grand, the grandparents to bring up children because they have very bad values. So, I think that there's a different uh, orientation towards tradition. And I think that uh, it is, I think it gives uh, some East European societies a certain measure of uh, rootedness and embeddedness by the fact that there's something that, that is there that they can hold on to, rather than live in a world where their values just goes right through their hand. Uh, and I think that, uh, I mean, I was quite surprised that uh, Christianity has resurfaced in Hungary, because Hungary has always been a very, um, Christianity in Hungary has always been very, uh, very, relatively not that serious. People were Christian, but they didn't make a big deal out of it. And, and, the, and it wasn't something that was really that important in the 20th century. I think it was very, very interesting for a lot of people that Christianity became a way in which they could give meaning to their identity. So if you go, walk around Budapest or anywhere else on a Sunday, you'll find that people go to church and it, with this kind of, it's a performance of respectability for them. This is the way they demonstrate that they are you know, respectable people. That's quite important for them. Uh, and which is why they get very, very angry when Hungary's Christianity is made fun of. So it's kind of a. Yeah, two more questions. Well, two, two quick, but first of all, the, well, okay, but very quick, I'll, I'll try to tie them up. Um, Christianity was also used to, against communism in Hungary in the 60s and 70s as a way to counter the... Absolutely. Yeah, so, but I was wondering, you haven't actually talked directly about migration and the difference between you, Poland, Hungary, and Western, the Western European countries. And I was wondering, if the EU were to change its <laughs> migration policies, would that increase uh, cohesion within the EU or not? And also, how do you see of everything that you talked about, how do you see it possibly playing out in the future? How do you see where is Europe, the EU heading? Well, I think that uh, it's a very difficult question, but, uh, but I, I would draw the conclusion is that the, um, in the European Union, in its present form, cannot survive. Uh, I think we're fast moving towards what I see as a two-track Europe. Uh, and that's uh, for a number of reasons, economic being one of them. I think it's unsustainable for the euro to be a common currency between countries at such different levels of productivity. I don't think that uh, you, know, you could have uh, expect countries like Greece or Italy or even Portugal, and, well, Portugal is a bit different, but Spain, to be able to survive the kind of uh, austerity measures that are being demanded if the euro is going to. So I think what we're going to see gradually is a kind of twin track Europe, with perhaps the euro being the currency of a small number of countries and some other arrangements being made. But I think that there is a very strong challenge. Uh, I think Italy is a very good example because I think the, the uh, dislike of the European Union, which the Italians have shown, is m very widespread. I mean, people don't often do not, because it, until now it was all Brexit. It was the English and Brexit. But actually, 
uh, British society are much more pro-EU than many other parts of Europe. That's the that's a really kind of funny thing, the kind of visceral dislike of the European Union that you get in parts of Italy or even parts of France. You don't get in, in, in England in the same, ki same kind of a way. So there is a kind of reaction that has occurred, and I, and I think that's, that's going to be taken into account. So whatever happens, you know, sort of the EU will not look like the way it is, and, and, and that's a good thing because maybe, I hope, we can develop a different European Union, you know, one that is less political, you know, less interventionist, less social engineering, but one that, you know, creates a, a continental-wide dynamic where we can, you know, come and go as, as we please and all the rest of that. So that's what I would like to see occurring. And I think that that, that that could be a possibility if a few more countries move down the same road as, as, as Italy has done. On migration, I think migration, uh, it, it, I think that has passed now. I think it, it's, it's more than migration that's the issue. I think the the culture wars and the tensions and the conflict are not just simply about migration. I think the Islam issue is very, very important uh, in East Europe because I, you have to remember if you're a Hungarian, you know, and, and, and it's interesting that even the left in Hungary hasn't been demanding that uh, Hungary adopts the migration policy that Merkel wants Hungary to adopt. I mean, if you're Hungarian and you've never had in, you know, a truly independent existence and you, you lived under the Ottoman Empire, and you go and, and, and see what's happening in Bosnia and Kosovo and Albania, where you see Saudi Arabians and Iranians and various other Middle Eastern NGOs being established, you, know, you, know, you really are worried. I mean, I was in Romania recently, and the Romanians were even more worried about this particular uh, development kind of occurring. And it may be wrong, but that's the way people see the in, in people's minds, the Ottoman Empire is still a living reality. It's not in Holland, you know, because it had never occurred. It's not in... It's not in England, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's very much a living reality, and I think that people are wary. At the same time, a lot of Hungarians I've talked to are saying we should be a bit more generous. We should really, you know, sort of w find a way of helping. And, and, and the expressions that Hungarians use is these poor people. In other words, they actually recognize that there's a, there's a need to do something about, you know, sort of the refugees that are circulating around, around the world. But I think that's going to have to be resolved in a way that is uh, that kind of uh, allows every single nation to make their own decision about, about who they want to come in, on what basis, what kind of status do you give the people that are kind of coming in, and that will take a bit of time to unfold. I think there's a last question over here. Who wasn't there? Or? Um, in your speech, you mentioned that um, the EU is promoting anti-nationalist sentiments as if um, there's only a small political group that actually um, has these this, uh, beliefs. Um, don't you think that there also um, these sentiments live among the people, and what is the reason for it? That was my question. Wh which sentiments exist among the people? Anti-nationalists? Well, the anti-nationalists. Uh, sure. I mean, I think that uh, you know, my whole family is anti-national. I mean, the, the anti-national, a reaction to nationalism, is obviously there, but I think there's a difference between uh, people who, for example, have said, well, look what happened in the interwar period. Uh, look at what nationalism did in the 20s and the 30s, and saying we should, we've got to be a little bit careful like that. And what the EU is doing, which is, for example, I, I give a lot of illustrations in my book, where they basically say, we don't want to teach national history, because that's dangerous. So we denationalize history. We teach this kind of very sanitized form of, of European history or where you basically have a strategy which the U European Union has where we're promoting regionalism, where we're promoting all kinds of identities throughout Europe. You know, if you look at the EU policies, they, every single identity uh, imaginable is being celebrated by the European Union, except for one identity, which is national identity. It's okay to be, have a regional identity, but if you have a strong national identity, that's seen as being uh, you know, sort of a, a bit of a problem. Uh, so I think that there has been a fairly uh, clear attempt to denationalize people's public life. And I'm not making up, that's the, what the documents say themselves, that we need to create this kind of uh, non-national sort of sentiment. We, we need to create loyalties that are transcending the nation state. And I think that that has been very influential because most of the uh, cultural organizations that are dominant in Western Europe have signed up to that. You know, I mean, universities, schools, academic institutions, they've all 
sign up to that. And I think that what happened is that as a result of that, people who have uh, their own national sentiments actually feel a little bit guilty about it. You know, maybe I shouldn't feel you know, really Dutch. You know, maybe there's something wrong with me, you know, feeling that kind of a way. And I think that uh, attempt to alienate people from their past um, is something that's becoming a very important political issue, and people are really <coughs> reacting. And a lot of people are saying is that finally we can admit, we can say in public, that we do feel proud to be French. You know, sort of. And you could also argue, of course, that um, their history is European, and that the nation state is just a recent yeah. addition to it, and sort of an artificial inter a period in between. You could. I mean, if you, if you make that argument of, yeah. of I mean, um, your family is European for a long time, and um, you don't necessarily have to belong to, of course, the maybe somewhat artificial modern invention of a ethnic nation state, of course. Absolutely, and, 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 and as we all know, and, and the Greeks already realized this, is that every institution is artificial. Mm -hmm. Especially the nation state. I mean, well, not as, I mean, everything is. It's the I invention mean, of tradition, it's an, yeah. it's. But everything, I mean, you know, religion is a convention. I mean, just about everything sure. that we've done is, is created artificially. It just so happens, um, and, you, and one may not like it, that the uh, people's nationality uh, which is very much linked to the language that they speak. Sometimes, yeah. uh, Well, fairly often, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the particular cultural or religious norms uh, gave meaning to people in the modern world. Uh, ever since the 18th century, it's been quite central to people's lives. And therefore, people's uh, and ancestors and, and, and sense of belonging has been very much kind of bound sure. up with it. Yeah. Now, we might say that, ho, sure. ho, ho, that's artificial, but you know, it's not up to you and I to decide, or, or it's what people feel to be real that's really qu quite important, and it just so happens. Yeah, but if, it, if that leads to exclusion of people who are not seen as belonging to the same myth of common descent, I mean, that's, I mean, we just have to look into the history of our continent you know, a little bit to see yeah, but, but, what but, that leads to. Yeah, but, uh, you know, exclusion, is, is the monopoly over exclusion is, is not by the nation state. The European Union has done a really wonderful and, uh, and, and systematic job of excluding all kinds of people from the European Union, right? Sure. So uh, let's not have a double standard here, you know, sort of. If it has been qu quite open as well to a lot of people, and that's to the, I mean, a lot of people in other Central European countries say it's too open, of course, it's too inclusive, but. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah but all that I'm <laughs> saying is that when it comes to exclusion, you know, all human institutions seem to be equally complicit in it. And I think it's uh, a bit, uh, one-sided to point a finger at the nation state and overlook the fact that this is being done in, in the name of all kinds of other institutions. Uh, as Democrats, we, we need to be balanced in our assessment of these things. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for your very open talk, for your thoughts, for your time, uh, for the frankness of your uh, talk. And of, um, I'm looking really forward I was very inspired by your, um, uh, the things you said about democracy and how important it is. I'm looking really forward, because you just mentioned before the, this meeting that you're uh, going to work on a book on democracy. We're really looking forward to that. Um, um, and you had a book just published two days ago, I think, uh, uh, How Fear Works. It's coming out in Holland later on, but um, just two days ago. Thank you very much again for your, uh, uh, for your great talk. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.